I definitely am like a, a, a genuine, like hands-on builder. I don't know if I'll go back to like being a manager anytime soon, uh, because I just, this is like, I'm like in my zone right now. I'm like building and just loving it. Welcome back to Insights by Design, episode 14. We're here with Alex Freeberg. Alex, how are you today? Hey, I'm doing good. Thanks for having me on. We're thrilled to have you, and thanks for making time to speak with us. Alex, for those who aren't familiar with your work, would you just do a quick introduction? Absolutely. Yeah, my name is Alex Freeberg, uh, better known as Alex the Analyst on YouTube. I do all sorts of things, um, but right now, really focused on consulting. Uh, so I run a data analytics consulting company uh, where I consult with startups and tech companies. Uh, and then I have Analyst Builder, which is my data learning platform. And then, of course, YouTube and all the social media and stuff that comes along with uh, doing that kind of stuff. And Alex, I've been following you for a while. And one thing that I believe drives success and I think that you're an example of is consistently trying and Often we see folks like yourself who have reached success and continue building and we're like, oh, that's so awesome. They must be so talented. But what we don't see more often than not is all the effort and trying and failed attempts before that. I don't know if this is the case with you, but I suspect it may be. And before you became Alex, the analyst who everybody is familiar with, was there anything that you, you tried out before um, that didn't work out but helped you learn along the way? Uh, yeah, we didn't, we, we haven't talked about this before, uh, uh, before this, but, um, I did have one other YouTube channel. It was called the Berg source. Uh, it's still up. You can go find it. Um, I left all my videos up there and I tell people about it. I used to review watches. Uh, I love watches. Uh, I love, and so I had videos about how to clean watches and different movements and styles. And I made like 15 videos. It wasn't anything crazy. Um, but I, I failed pretty miserably because I ran out of money. I was very broke at the time and I couldn't afford to buy other watches. Uh, so that ended that dream. Um, but I definitely like really liked the recording process and the editing. And I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Um, and that kind of segued into creating Alex, the analyst. Um, uh, and it, it, it really pushed me beyond just being an employee. Uh, it kind of gave me this outlet to... Uh, do something other than just work all the time. Uh, and so, cause I had little kids at the time, I didn't have much time for my other hobbies, which were like golf and hiking and, you know, outdoor things. So I was indoors all the time, but, you know, taking care of kids out in Dallas. And so it kind of segued into uh, creating this YouTube channel. What gave you the initial spark to try to create something? Um, it was, I would say uh, more, it was very driven by just wanting to help people. Um, I, when I started out as a data analyst, there were very few resources out there. There was a few Udemy courses. I mean, not a ton, but there was like a few Udemy courses. There were some people on YouTube, but I never really vibed with almost anyone online. Like I never had someone where I was like, this guy or this girl like really is like teaching me a lot. I never really had that moment. And as I got into, I was like three years into being a data analyst um, and I got my big break at like uh, a fortune 10 company. I was like, I was like, you know, I feel like I could really help people um, because it was very tough for me <clears throat> to get going in my career. It took a long time um, and I had a lot of failures and I was like, you know, I really think I could help people do it better than the way I did it because I made so many mistakes on my path to becoming a data analyst that I was like, I think. I think I should make some tutorials and videos and, and, you know, teach people how to get into this career. I didn't know if there was a big market for it at all. Like I was like, this could be like 10,000 people out there in the world who would be interested in this content. Um, but I just made it because I truly enjoyed it. And so even for the first eight months, I basically had nobody watching my videos. I was just making them for fun um, and to be helpful to anyone out there who was watching. I love that. And it's that it's that get up and go mentality of taking the idea of I want to help people. I could create t tutorials to actually doing it because doing it is hard. 
over time it gets easier, hard. but the first few are hard. Maybe they're not that good, but you kept going and kept building. And yeah. I feel like just over the last few years where I've been watching you, um, you know, stalking you from the LinkedIn bushes, <laughs> I've seen you just continue to grow and build, including building analyst builder. Like you're never, it, f- it feels like you're a builder. You keep building things. Yeah. Is, is that something yeah. that drives you? Yeah. Yeah. I, um, I've learned that about myself probably in the past two years that I really have a passion for building things. And I didn't know that at all about myself until about two years ago. Um, it actually really happened right around when I became a manager of analytics. At that time, I was a data analyst. I was working um, on a, under a data science umbrella for the collection data collection team. I was working very closely with our data engineering department, very closely with our data science department. And I'd been in my position for two years, and I think I was really excelling in the position, and both the data engineering team wanted to bring me on as a junior data engineer, and the data scientists want to bring me on as just a data scientist. Um, And so I had these two options, and uh, my YouTube channel at that time had reached like 150,000 subscribers or so. And I kind of was like, well, if I go down one of these paths, that might be weird. Um, and I really had this plan in my head that I was going to be a manager, like work my up to way up to VP, CTO, CEO of like a company. Um, and so I got this opportunity as a operational uh, uh, manager of operational analytics in the IT department, and I would have like seven people underneath me. I, you know, it was a big deal um, for me at least. And so I took that job. And about six months in, I realized I was like, this is not this is not what I have a passion for. Um, it was mostly hiring people, some high-level strategy around data migration, cloud platforms. Um, But I I didn't get to build anything. And so I quit that job after about a year um, and started building Analyst Builder. And since then, like, I have been as fulfilled as I've ever been. Um, You talk to anyone around me, my wife, uh, you know, my close friends, or, you know, even the YouTube uh, data content creator community, they all, I, I talk about it because it just makes me so happy. I've been building Analyst Builder with my team for, it, it, it took us a year to build it. And now we've launched for five months and we're, we're, we're iterating and building like a startup. And it, it just like, I'm just like pumped about it. Um, and I think it's one of the best platforms out there. And so I, I definitely am, I definitely am like a, a, a genuine, like hands-on builder. I don't know if I'll go back to like being a manager anytime soon. Uh, because I just, this is like, I'm like in my zone right now. I'm like building and just loving it. So tell us more about Analyst Builder. What would you say is the value proposition? Yeah, so there's there's a lot of learning platforms out there, and I've used almost all of them. Um, and so you have Data Quest, Data Camp, Udemy, Coursera, uh, Leak Code. I've used all of them um, in my journey of being a data analyst. And so um, the value proposition for Analyst Builder is one, it's just completely data analyst center. Um, it's not for, you know, database developers or data engineers, or I'm not bleeding all this content together. It's hyper-focused on one thing. Um, so people who are trying to break in analytics, that's a very good thing because you're not going to get confused on what you need to learn and not learn. You'll have it like right there. The other thing is, and this is uh, another big reason why I created Analyst Builders, I don't want to just be another Udemy creator. Um, and the... Unity space is very competitive, but I thought I could have done a great job on Udemy. Um, but I wanted more for my users. I didn't just want another course. I wanted them to be, I wanted users to be able to take my courses, but also then be able to practice it. Um, and that's not easy to find. And so when we were creating, when I, before we started building Analyst Builder, I actually went to some competitors and said, hey, I have this vision where you can code and do it at the same time, uh, at the same time, kind of like a data camp, um, but in a slightly different way. And all of them were like, it's a great idea. It's just not what we have planned for our business. I totally respected that. Um, and so I was like, you know what? I'm not giving up on this. I'm just going to build it myself. Um, and so I found a guy, uh, his name's Kasu, and I found a guy who was really smart, like just really, really, really smart at building and understood exactly what I wanted. And so the value proposition is really you get me as your teacher. So, you know, if you like how I teach on uh, YouTube, I go probably two to three times more in depth on each topic um, uh, on Analyst Builder 
But then as you're going through it, you also get to practice these questions in the window or in the uh, on the platform instead of having to kind of find your own or download different data sets. It's all there for you, which is just, it's really, really fun. Uh, and then it has a whole questions page about like practice technical questions in SQL and Python. Um, and I, I have, my goal was to make it as fun as possible. Like if you read the questions, some of them are just goofy, like they're just funny. So I try not to take it crazy seriously, which a lot of other platforms are like, uh, really serious. And so I try to like be fun and goofy. And in the answers, I have a, a solution for every question, like how to solve it in SQL. And even in that, I'm like, I just feel like it's like laid back and relaxed and chill and fun. And so I think that is, that is like the biggest thing. And the thing I'm most proud of about the platform is that it's not, it's not boring. It's a really fun platform to learn on. You anticipated my next question because you've mentioned having fun a couple times already. And I was going to ask yeah. you, how does Analyst Builder reflect fun? But yeah. I, I think you're right that teaching and training should be fun because otherwise it can be really hard to slog through something as complex as data analytics. Yeah. Well, that's it. that was another piece that I didn't like about learning certain things in analytics is that when I was first starting out, I had I took a lot of courses like way too many courses. Uh, I should have not needed to take so many, but there were just a lot of boring ones and I didn't like them and it really felt like work and it wasn't enjoyable. And so what I've tried to do with Analyst Builder is create courses and content that people just like are like laughing. And I get messages a lot from people taking Analyst Builder. They're, they're like, this is like really fun to take. And that's what I like. I get the most excited about because when people enjoy it, they learn better, they learn faster, and then they share it with their friends and they share it with others. And we have done, I've done zero advertising for Analyst Builder and the natural growth. I I post about it maybe twice a month so far. So I maybe made like 10 posts about it. I made it like a few YouTube videos and I really don't post a lot about it. I could do it like several times a week, but I don't. And it's having just real natural big growth because so many people are sharing it because they really like what's on there. Um, and so that's been really, really, really encouraging. Uh, just the feedback from the users, they're like, this is just like, it's I'm smiling and I'm laughing while I'm learning. And that's what it's all about. Like, it's just about having fun and learning at the same time. And I, I felt a similar track to you. You don't know this. We haven't talked about this, but I was actually in the process of building something similar to, an, to analyst builder. And I met with Nick Singh, who did Data Lemur, to talk about, like, how did you get the, the code embedded in the website? And I met with a lot of people, and I was in the process of building it. And I saw Analyst Builder launched, and I was like, oh, okay, this is exactly what I wanted to do. I'm like, this is perfect. <laughs> so I was like, I'll just be an affiliate for Alex. So I post about Analyst yeah. Builder all the time, because, yeah, first of all, the quality is, is super high. There, I love that you were a data analytics manager. So the advice you give comes from both a practitioner, but also from what are companies looking for in an analyst, which sometimes you can yeah. miss if you've never had to hire data analysts. And third, it's a passion project. Like you can see that you care about the details of the program. So for me, it's really yeah. easy to talk about and share with people. Yeah. Yeah. And I very much appreciate that too. Um, it, it, it was probably one of the most difficult things I've ever been a part of, like build wise. I've worked with really complex data engineering problems in like real companies where we're migrating full scale systems to the cloud and it's very complex. I think this one took the cake. It's um, it, we, my team mostly did a lot of the heavy lifting, but you know, they, they built most of it from scratch. Like everything you see is um, mostly code. We have very few integrations, um, which makes it really unique because most other platforms that you see uh, have m a ton of microservices or third-party companies that they just kind of put together. Um, and it's not it's not as structurally, uh, architecturally sound. And so what you get is a lot of issues with incorrect answers or uh, the query times take a long time because of scaling issues. But we have I, the, exactly how the website is now. We envisioned it over a year ago and we built it with a very specific scaling solution in mind. And so 
we use AWS for and Kubernetes and and um, Docker for a lot of our um, our scaling stuff. But it's even just knowing, like telling you guys this to actually solve it is still very, very, very complex. And so we, I would not even we. I'm going to say Kasun, who is like I would. He's like my second half in this project. He had this idea or the design in his head before we started anything. And he was just like, I know exactly how to build this. He's like, I, I think this is exactly how it's going to work. And if you go back and look at his designs, we built it almost exactly from a year ago, how it is. And it's um, it, it's pretty amazing. It's, it's really, really good. Were there any points in your journey of building Analyst Builder where you became discouraged or wanted to give up? Oh, big time. Big time. Um, I almost gave up on it when in, in March of 2023, when a almost a year ago, when AI was really starting to take prominence, I was like, oh boy. I was like, I don't know if data analysis is going to get replaced. I didn't know much about AI at the time. Um, and so for probably two weeks, I was very discouraged. I was like, I really feel like I had poured myself into uh, this project and not just the project, but the field of analytics and like gained a specialty and like really, really put a lot into this. And I'm like, I feel like it could all be gone in, you know, a few years. Now that I've really dived into AI and everything uh, that encompasses, I feel more confident now than ever that analysts are going to have a big place in the future. I think it's going to be actually a larger, um, there's going to be a larger market for analysts and uh, more specific types of analysts in the future just based off of how much data we're going to need, the types of people who are going to be working with AI and the systems to collect the data. I think we're going to need more in the fact. And so once I kind of like started learning more, talking to people in the field who were using it and got more hands-on experience, I started to get a regained sense of confidence. And now I'm more confident now than ever that it's a very going to be a very good, profitable, uh, good career to go into in the future as well. So talk to us more about data analytics and AI. When you say AI, what do you have in mind and what trends do you see coming down the pike? Yeah, AI is um, it's a very broad term. Um, and I, I th I'm sure you guys have seen AI generated videos and photos and all of those. So many different things that AI kind of has encompassed. For, specifically for analytics, a lot of what I see and this isn't just my experience. I've also talked to a lot of startups and I consult with some startups that are using AI. Um, so I talked to a lot of people in the field and for analytics specifically, a lot of coding pieces are going to be, you know, part of AI. Um, a lot of data visualization, especially the really simple stuff, um, just creating basic metrics, uh, creating basic charts and graphs, those types of things AI can do quite well. Um, and then things like understanding the data, I think it does quite well. Now, there are a lot of deficiencies as well, and I'll get into that a little bit. But when I think of analytics and AI, I'm thinking something very similar to uh, maybe Microsoft Copilot or ChatGPT. Um, and what we're seeing already is that there's a lot of integrations that are being built out right now that are still in progress. Like Microsoft Copilot is a, definitely a work in progress. Uh, I did a review of it. I wasn't very impressed. Uh, it's quite slow, had a lot of issues. Um, and so they'll make, they'll get better. Um, but in the future of the good things or things that I think that it'll really help us with, I think that coding is just a big one and everybody's been using it up for the past year. So that's not, no, nothing new. The other thing is really understanding code ba uh, databases. Um, design choices with data modeling and, and stuff like that, just understanding what's already there. Um, I think it does quite well. And so I've been coming into new code bases and new databases, and I'm asking ChatGPT, hey, you know, here's what I'm seeing. What am I missing? And it'll kind of describe it to me. And I'm like, okay, I did miss that. Or, oh, you're wrong on this. But, I, you know, I missed that piece. And that's very beneficial to anybody. Um, so those pieces, uh, I think, are really, really useful. Now, AI especially when you're working with in some aspects of data, kind of in a, a more precise science, you don't want to get certain calculations wrong, certain codes wrong, certain joins. Uh, I've noticed a lot of people using uh, ChatGPT very closely with 
coding while not having coding experience. I've already seen the repercussions that it's had. Um, I've come into uh, uh, some consulting gigs recently over the past couple months. And I was like, okay, how did you get here? How'd you get to this point? And they were like, well, uh, we brought in somebody who was designing. This is more of a, a, a coding issue, but more of a design issue with their architecture. So I got in there and I'm like, okay, you know, you're using a data warehouse. I'm super familiar with these. I was like, how did you, how did you create this? And they're like, well, we mostly use ChatGPT. And I was like, okay, walk me through, like, what did it tell you to do and why? And so they're walking me through and I'm figuring all these things out. And I'm like, okay, I know the issue. ChatGPT doesn't understand these things about these data warehouses. And then I explained it to them. They're like, yeah, we didn't know that. And so the specialty there is a big, big, big piece of it. It's really good at understanding uh, uh, even some advanced things. But when you're designing something that needs to be scalable, that needs to be, um, it needs to ingest data in a certain way. And it needs to have a certain schema to combine all this different data together. ChatGPT does not do well. And I've learned that pretty quickly because I've tried to do it. And so it has a lot of deficiencies with coding. And I've noticed that if you don't already know the skill, uh, you're at a big disadvantage. Uh, and so I've seen a lot of people, especially with Python, try to build things with Python that they've never, ever built before. And what they do is they trust it implicitly. And then what ends up happening is, is you know, it's it cobbles together something that might even work. It, you could even get as far as it working, but what's not going to be working well is all the systems and all the dependencies that are needed for that code to work that ChatGPT just doesn't have knowledge of or understanding of. And that's the piece that a lot of people don't understand about coding in the real production environment. And so um, that I think has been one of the biggest issues that companies specifically have been having issues with with coding is people just trusting it as a source of truth instead of a framework for you to then go back and do correctly. Um, <clears throat> and so I've talked for quite a bit. Uh, I'm not going to keep <laughs> keep churning it out, even though I could keep talking about it. But that's some of my initial thoughts around AI analytics, the good, the bad, just kind of in a nutshell. So how can we cultivate the kinds of literacies or awareness for people not to treat chat GPT and other AI technologies like a black box. You put something in, it spits something out and you just take it and run with it. How do we unpack the black box, so to speak? Well, I think just people have to just make the mistakes. Uh, you, you know, that it's a new technology. It's a new uh, piece of, you know, a new tool in the toolbox. And so until that people make those mistakes and realize it, they're just going to, you know, trust it. So it, it has been really eye-opening the people I've worked with and consulted with, and they've learned that mistake pretty quick. And they're like, okay, you know, we need to take a step back. We need to reevaluate our AI plan, or if, even if we want to use it anymore because of some of the issues that they've been having. Um, and I think that's the biggest learning piece of, of, for everybody. Once you start using it, then you start realizing it's uh, uh, the downside and the upside. And you can kind of, um, pick and choose your battles based off of that knowledge. So I don't know if there's going to be like any standardization of you can't use it for this, you use it for this. I think it's just going to be you, everyone's going to, you know, do something wrong or mess something up and you'll have to learn from that experience. Here's an off the wall question as we promised. So at what point do you think ChatGPT will become aware of itself and become a sentient being? <laughs> I don't think um, I don't think it's going to happen anytime soon. <laughs> um, I think we're going to need to see some really big breakthroughs um, because, in my opinion, even right now, it has some it has some general logic. It has some some problem solving skills, and I think it's really impressive. But I don't think it's doing anything that it's not just you know taking from sources doing some simple logic and giving us a, an interesting output, kind of predicting what's coming next based off of all this aggregated data that's pulled in and all its models. So I don't think it's uh, going to be soon. I think we're looking at probably another, in my opinion, like 20, 30, 50 years. You know, that answer could change in five years or so. But I just think 
based upon what I've seen and listened to some of the experts in the area who know more about the AGI piece of it, you know, a lot of them are more, they're, they're more hesitant to say it's going to be anytime soon. So I, I kind of tend to just, that's their area of expertise. And so uh, I kind of, in some ways, trust them a little bit more than my intuition. And AI in analytics, I've been meeting with a lot of companies and coming up with strategies around how to implement AI, because unlike other digital transformations, it, which typically came from the bottom up, now this is coming from the top down from the board saying, we don't want to fall behind, figure out a way to implement gener generative AI specifically into our business yeah. strategy. But I, I tell them to treat it more like a junior analyst. There's automate versus augment, which you've talked about, but you, even though you can abstract away some of the work, you can't abstract away your responsibility for the quality of that work. And to your point, you have to know whether or not the work is good quality. So you can't, yeah. you, you can't, we wouldn't just give a junior analyst a senior analyst responsibility without having some kind yeah. of QA on the back end. So even though it can speed things up, you have to have that QA knowledge and responsibility to make it work correctly. Absolutely. Yeah, that's a great way to describe it. What are you most excited about in 2024? What I am most excited about this year? Um, I'm I'm personally really excited about Analyst Builder. We've already talked about it, so I'm not going to talk much more uh, unless you have you know more specific questions you want me to answer. But I've just been I've just been spending a lot of time on it, investing in it, and so that's like I, I I'm just so passionate about. It. I'm just really 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 into it right now, and so that's what I'm most excited about. Um, Kind of professionally i'm still doing consulting i'm still doing my youtube stuff all you know people are very worried uh they're very worried when i post about analyst build they're like oh gosh you're not gonna do youtube anymore you just are trying to monetize you know your content i was like no no no. i'm still gonna do my youtube thing i didn't know oh i have content for the next like two years planned out i was like i have no shortage of of content uh so don't worry all my content to youtube will flow as normal uh, and, but you know i've just been really focused on analyst builder and personally like outside of the professional world um really excited to, uh, you know i'll be moving soon i'm um, just getting out of the suburbs which will be nice um and yeah and we might get another dog uh so that's always fun <laughs> and so yeah that's about it i don't have i my, my life isn't too crazy <laughs> how many dogs do you have right now we have two. They're sitting right over there. Uh, one's a golden retriever and one's a, a poodle mix. He's kind of a mutt, but he's mostly poodle. And what <laughs> what are you thinking about getting? Uh, my wife wants a dachshund, one of those little yeah. leaner dogs. She grew up with them. She's owned many of them. And so she's been missing her little friend. And so I think we're going to get one of those. If you really want to embrace South Carolina, get a Boykin Spaniel. South Carolina's oh, official state dog is the Boykin Spaniel. And they're kind of similar to Cocker Spaniels. Nice. So if you want a fourth dog, I <laughs> think that's what I'd recommend. <laughs> yeah, don't 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 tell my wife that because she will want four dogs. <laughs> yeah. They also have the Carolinas have the Carolina dog, which is North America's only native dog, which they just Fortunately. found in like the eighteen hundreds wandering around the swamps of the Carolinas. It looks like a dingo. It's a really cool dog. Oh, it just so like I expect you get a Carolina dog and a dachshund. Yeah, so, yeah. And a we'll boy whole And a boy kid. Yeah, we'll just get all the dogs. <laughs> you're moving out of the suburbs. Unless you're moving in, yeah. in the other way and moving further into the city, then I, I expect you might have some room to have some more dogs, Alex. Yeah, yeah. That's the goal. <laughs> so talk to us about work-life balance then, because it seems like you spend a lot of time with your work, but it also sounds like you're making time for family and your dogs and not getting burned out. How do you balance yeah. your work with the rest of your life? Yeah, that's a good question. I actually get that one quite a bit um, because I talk a lot about my family on like social media and I have a wife, I have three kids, I have two dogs, two cats and some fish. Um, and so I do, and they're, the kids are 11, five and three. So they're not like older and self-sufficient they're you know they really want to spend a lot of time with uh with the family and um i kind of figured out this work-life balance many years ago when the pandemic started um, my kids were very little like just newborns 
um, and we were living out in Dallas. And uh, this was right, I guess, right when I started my YouTube channel um, about like four years ago. And I just kind of like created this over time. But what ended up happening was, is I would work during the day. My wife quit her job to be a stay-at-home mom during the pandemic and until like three months ago when she started her own business, she was a stay-at-home mom. And, um, you know, during the day I would work and then I'd spend family time. And then at night I would record a video for YouTube. That was my routine for like two years. Um, and then we moved out uh, about two years ago out to South Carolina and, uh, my wife is still a stay-at-home mom. Uh, but one of my kids or two of my kids now are in school. And so I found a slightly different routine, which is I help get them. And this is like my everyday routine. I help get them ready in the morning from 7 15 to 3 30. I work. So I get like a full work day in, and then they come home and I just completely shut everything off. So then from 3 30 to about eight o'clock, it's just family time. We play games. We play catch in the backyard. We go on the trampoline. We cook dinner. We eat. We do movie nights. Uh, and then they go to sleep. After they go to sleep, I usually do about three or four hours more work after they go, went to sleep. So usually around like 8.30 to around 11.30, sometimes midnight, almost even to this day, like every single day I do that. And it's just ingrained in me like that's what I do now. Um, and so I very much have a huge focus though on my family. And so if this schedule took away from my family time, I wouldn't be doing it. Um, and in fact, when I started Analyst Builder, started taking up a lot more time and I, you know, I made a, an agreement with my wife. I said, listen, my family will always be number one. And I don't want you to ever feel like you're competing with me for my work, even though I really love it. So the agreement is, is if I ever start not focusing on the family as much, if I'm getting away from it, that she used to remind me to go back on track and I'll try to do it myself as well. But if I ever can't bring myself back, whatever's distracting me, I'm just going to stop whatever it is. Like I'm just going to fully take a step back and prioritize the family. And so that's our agreement. And, and up until now we've had zero issues. Um, you know, I, I feel like I get a lot of time with the kids and uh, I don't work weekends except for at night once they go to bed. And so I'm still working 55, 60, 50, in between 50 and 60 hours a week, depends on the week, but I still get a ton of work in and I get, I feel like I'm get as much time as I could possibly want with my kids. And so, uh, I feel like it works great. I love that you built a system with, with your wife and having that open communication is super important and having that accountability. Yeah. I've met with lots and lots of executives. I was just at a CTO conference and more often than not, many of them regret focusing so much on work while their kids were little. And so yeah. it's an important reminder because as you're working and trying to provide, Michael and I, you know, struggle with this a lot with, with our work-life balance because he and I both work at a ton, but it's, yeah. it's good, better, and best. It's like, it's really good to work and to provide and you need to make sure you've got that baseline, but you can't replace family time. And you know, your son yeah. or your, your child is 11 at this point And it's like, oh they're more than halfway through the time that they will spend at home. <laughs> my, my oldest son oh, yeah. is 12. And I think about that a lot. I'm like, oh shoot, six years left. Yeah. I'm like, he's two thirds of the way through his quote unquote childhood. Oh, I know. Oh, I have that exact same thought all the time. Um, and in fact, that's partially why we're moving is to kind of have a little bit of room that not, it's not a bigger home. It's just has a little bit of land, which gives us you know, a little bit more because we have a very tiny backyard. And so it gives us a little bit more space to, you know, maybe get chickens or, mm -hmm. you know, whatever, just to create those memories while they're still here. Because, yeah, we're we're dreading when our kids leave. I like we don't want them to. We want them to live close to us and like, you know, bring their friends over and spend as much time as we can with them. Like they are definitely our number one priority. And I will say one of the things that has helped me the most is just being able to work remote mm -hmm. because when I was in the office, I had an hour commute there, an hour commute. Well, it was like 45 minutes, but a 45 commute there and back. And I get home, I get off at four and there was traffic. So then it was like, I got back at five, I ate dinner and put the kids to bed mm -hmm. with this system. I, they come home and we get to play and draw and do fun things. Then we have dinner and 
go to bed. And so I get like an extra two or three hours a day with my kids I didn't have when I worked in person. And that is like invaluable to me. That is, I, I, you know, I've had offers from a lot of companies to come and work for them as a manager, even a, an offer for a director role, which paid really well. And I was like, you know, it's not worth it. The extra 75, 100,000 that I would have gotten per year based uh, compared to what I'm currently making, I was like, it's just not worth it. You know, I, I live a very happy life. I provide for my family. And now that I have that built up, I'm like, I really want to make sure that I don't push it too far where I'm like, I'm only focused on making an income and providing instead of like you said, exactly. Like, that's why I said what you said was perfect instead of, you know, forgetting my family and like missing out on all the really important stuff when they're young. And that's one reason I love that you built Analyst Builder because uh, previous to being in data, I was a finance executive and finance has to be on the ground. There's federal regulations around that. But with data, so many of the jobs, not all of them, but many of the jobs, one, pay enough where you can feel comfortable and be able to meet your obligations. And two, most of them are remote or there's at least a lot of remote opportunities, which Good beyond move. just the paycheck really can increase your work-life balance. Yeah. So Alex, you work a lot from home. What does your home office look like? We can see a little of, of it behind you, but are you a mostly blank walls kind of guy? Do you have a window? How do you arrange it so that when you sit down at your desk, you can be super productive? Yeah, let me show you. It's a bit of a mess. I'm going to take this off real quick. I'm going to like selfie mode. This is a webcam. All right, so this is my office. Uh, it, it's just like a little thing back here. Uh, here's this side. And then I'll turn you around for a second. You'll see my whole setup. So I have, um, let's see what I can show you. So this, this is like, I have my two there computers. I got my Discord open and there's you guys. I got my camera. Oh, I'm there we go. I got my nice camera. Guitar. Yeah, I got my guitar. I got my mic. Um, and then my lighting over here. And so, and then there's another mic. And so, uh, and then there's like this foldable desk. I have, um, my wife is, she gets so mad at me. She's like, you have this piece of junk desk um, <laughs> that we got at like a garage sale, but I don't need anything better. I I, I just, that it works for me. I don't need anything better. Um, and so this is my office and I have these doors. So it's like barn doors where they, they close like that. Um, and then I have these two windows, which I, I put, um, uh, what are the light like curtains where the light can't get through because I need certain lighting for my videos. And so I like almost never open them. Um, I like a really dark, um, quiet environment, I would say. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, that's just kind of how I prefer it. I don't like a lot of sunlight and I don't know. <laughs> that's just, that's just how I like it. But yeah, it's, it works great. I, I love it. It's not very big. It's like maybe 10 by 10. That's my size of my office. So it's like a small room, but uh, works perfect for what I need. See, you can run an analytics empire from a 10 by 10 space <laughs> on a table well, you I got know. at a garage sale. <laughs> yeah, you know, when I, this is, this I've had this kind of setup since I moved here. It's so like for the past two years. But even before that, two years and before, I did all my YouTube stuff out of my kitchen. So like all my YouTube videos before I moved here, you know, I... um recorded in my kitchen once my kids went up to bed upstairs I would record there and then I and I had my all my equipment in a garage so I'd bring all my equipment out set it up I'd record for an hour and I'd put it all back and um that was just what I did so this is like a this is a massive step up like I have zero complaints this is great I love it so you don't need a lot to get started you you just gotta no. get started yeah yeah I agree well, Alex thank you so much we Love what you're doing. I'm excited to see Analyst Builder continue to grow and excited to see what you continue to do. I'm going to change your name from Alex the Analyst to Alex the Builder. <laughs> we'll, we'll take Bob out. There's no more Bob the Builder. It's now Alex the Builder. <laughs> Alex, I like it. thank you so much, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks. Have a good one, guys. All right. See you, Alex. Alex.